for the cloud server good okay right so let's see if we can bash on so what i thought we'd do is um look at some orthopedic terminology and that type of thing and in these in this series of lectures or sort of seminars is to try and approach orthopedics slightly differently but we'll talk about that towards the end okay so first things first what i thought we'd try and do is talk about some words that we use so so that's me mr mitchler i'm virtual today but i am an actual person with feelings and uh, children who misbehave and that's a snapshot of my life if you've ever heard me speaking before you'll know that i use this kind of slide a lot but i'm actually a leeds graduate and then came to the northeast by accident which is a long story and then visited the other newcastle in new south wales to do a fellowship in shoulder surgery and then came back to sunderland and i'm a shoulder and elbow surgeon there and that believe it or not is a shoulder and there's an elbow okay so they're my uh, my loves in life so the real truth of it is that we're all idiots basically but um we can fool some of the people some of the time so the surgical society which if you're not a member of by the way I would strongly suggest uh, you join because they run fabulous programs and mentor stuff, post-mortems, conferences, all kinds of things. Uh, as they'll rightly or wrongly tell you, I'm a highly respected shoulder and elbow surgeon at the City Hospital of Sunderland. So that's me. Now, virtual orthopedics actually we've used for a long while. And you'll see it's actually ten a penny. So here's one of my uh, examples. This is a glenoid. So that's the socket of the shoulder. So you can see the socket of the shoulder just here. And this is a bony defect. So virtually we can plan surgery and we've used 3D reconstructions in CT scans and in planning, making implants and printing and all kinds of things for quite a while. Um, but uh, this is a glenoid with a big defect that we're planning how to work on. So that's a lot of virtual stuff which we've been using for a good few years in orthopedics. And this is a slightly more uh, recent example, I suppose it's fair to say, in that um, you we run virtual trauma clinics. Actually, we've been running them at Sunderland because we're trying to minimise people coming to the hospital. So we do have that kind of minimal stuff. Um, so the problem with it is that really you guys are guinea pigs. Like I say, we don't normally give virtual teachings. Orthopedics is very, very hands-on. So if you're trying to teach orthopedics, we're talking about function and we're talking about examination and physical signs. It's very, very important to you know, have the patient exposed correctly. So you guys on my tiny screen are really guinea pigs for what we're trying to do here. So hopefully you can give us a bit of guidance as we go along as to what we can make better, what was terrible, what was good, what we should do again. So we're kind of relying on you guys a little bit, okay? And uh, if you've got elderly folks or grandparents, you'll know that this guy is me and this guy is the teaching fellow because frankly without the teaching fellows and julie stewart there's no chance i get this up line and, and up and go so big big thanks to those guys as well so today's talk and actually subtitle is what the bloody hell are they talking about because if you've ever sat in any of our trauma meetings or anything like that you'll know that we use jargon and all kinds of words that maybe we assume that you guys understand but you might not do so hopefully we're going to try and demystify some of those words and i've picked 10 terms that i think that we use a lot which are very key to what we're talking about which may or may not be understood terrifically well okay so the first one now i'm just going to escape that for a second just to come back to the zoom there we go so uh give me two secs I'm going to try and unmute you all again just for a second. So let's stop that share for two ticks. So uh, before I start with that talk, everybody should have their microphones back on again. Uh, does that sound like a reasonable plan? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. yeah. So look, like I say, I'm going to I'm bash on with the talk and I'll keep the microphones on. So if you've got a question, like I say, I can see my screen and I'm going to try and minimize it as much as I can to try um just questions just shout out okay mm -hmm. good sure. we'll go from that current slide so, so the first one is arthritis so arthritis is a term that we use an awful lot and actually if you look at it the definition is very very difficult so i've put it's an inflammation of a joint which causes pain and stiffness but you could argue that arthritis is actually um a manifestation of clinical features you know it's itis is the uh, the suffix for inflammation so actually 
when we look at an x-ray with what we call arthritis, you could argue that we're looking at arthrosis, which is actually the degeneration of a joint. But most people would accept that if I show you that x-ray of, you know, hip or a knee or a shoulder with the wear and tear in it, that we're talking about arthritis. Okay, so I would say a recent definition is inflammation of a joint causing pain and stiffness. Remember those four signs of arthritis on an x-ray, joint space loss, osteophyte formation, subchondral cysts, and subchondral sclerosis. They're the four cardinal signs of arthritis in any synovial joint. So here's our x-ray with hopefully one normal, one abnormal, okay? So this is the normal side here, and you can see the femoral head. You can see the acetabulum just here. This is reasonably normal. Whereas if you look at the other side, you can see the bone on bone contact here. So the joint space has been absolutely lost here. So you've got lots of joint space. You can see these big vacuoles here, and these are synovial fluid filled cysts. They're the subchondral cysts. And because the bone has been compacted, it's got this really dense white look to it, and that's subchondral sclerosis. Um, we've also got a little bit of a collapse here as well, and you've got a marginal osteophyte. This little sharp spiky beak here, and this little bump on the edge of the femoral head, they're those four signs. Osteophyte, cyst formation, cyst, uh, subchondral sclerosis, and the loss of the joint space. So they're the four cardinal signs of arthritis on an x-ray. Okay? Good. Number two is arthroplasty, which is a word I think we use an awful lot and we don't make particularly clear what it is. However, arthroplasty is the surgical reconstruction or replacement. So arthroplasty can be either preserving young people's joints with hip um, arthroscopy, shoulder arthroscopy, any of that kind of stuff, or what we normally mean by arthros um, arthroplasty, which is to chop it out, throw it in the bin and give you a new one. Okay. So think about hip again. There's our, the hip that we just had a look at. That's the arthritic one. So if you're going to replace that hip, first of all, the reason for replacing it is pain relief. That's always the indication for any joint replacement. And we're going to come on and talk about that another time. But essentially, pain relief is the reason that we do joint replacement work. So if you're going to replace a hip joint, you need three bits. You need this bit here, which is the femoral stem. And this is a big chunk of metal that you can see flowing all the way down. You need a little ball on the top here is made of stainless steel. This is the femoral head that you've replaced. And you need this plastic cup. And interestingly, although this plastic cup is exactly what's on this x-ray, you can't see it because obviously the plastic is radio opaque. So you can't, you can see all the way through. There's cement behind it and you can see the metal, but you can't see the plastic cup. So that's a hip replacement. Good. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Fracture. Ah, the fracture. There's a fracture. Look at that. Go oh, I missed the fracture. You know, I'm doing a fracture for six weeks. I'm starting to feel very, very uh, off-handed. But anyway, there's a fracture. There's a fractured femur for us, right? So I would say a good definition for a fracture is a discontinuity in the cortex of a bone. That's a very, very standard definition of a fracture. And would pretty much cover you looking for a fracture on an x-ray. If you follow that cortex round and you can see the discontinuity, there must be a fracture there. Okay. Now. There are a couple of exceptions. So if you look at this schematic of what we got, okay? So look at this femur, you've got a transverse fracture there. The other thing is about fractures, the way that that fracture turns up or the shape that that fracture takes on tells you something about how the fracture has happened. So if you've got a transverse fracture like this one here, which is what my children would draw if I said, look, can you draw a broken bone? A transverse fracture means that all of a sudden you've put a load of energy into that bone and it's all hit one place. So if I got a baseball bat and hit that femur, you get a transverse fracture, okay? This one next door to it is an open injury. So you can see the bone is poked out through the skin. So open either means something from the outside has been in or something from the inside has got out. So the bone has poked through the soft tissue or a knife has been in or something like that. That's an open injury, okay? An oblique x-ray means that there's probably been a bit of a bend to the bone. So again, reasonably high energy injury. We don't see oblique and transverse injury. Um, a spiral injury down here is reasonably common. Bones are exceptionally strong, but if you want to get a bone to fail, one of the best ways to get it to fail is to give it a twist, and that's how you get a spiral injury. Okay. Uh, the other one, the other two I want to show you is a comminuted injury. So, a comminuted fracture or multifragmentary fracture, we call them now, is where something has happened where there's been a bit of a bend, a bit of a twist, a bit of a impact. Oh. 
combination of plenty of different injuries, okay? That's a commutative injury. And a segmental one is a very particular injury. So what that means is there are two separate fracture lines in the same bone. So the same high degree of energy is being given to that bone in two different spots, probably around about the same time. So a good example would be a car bumper hitting. So, you know, you've got the top and the bottom of the bumper hit you in two different spots, you get two fracture lines. That's a segmental injury. So the two things, like I said, there are a couple of things to be aware of. One is a green stick. So green stick fractures happen in children and you don't necessarily have to have a discontinuity, although you often do. And when you do, it's in one cortex because what happens in children's bones is they're very, very plastic. So you can deform them quite a lot without them failing, which adult bones do. And when they deform just enough that the bone gives, often what happens is one cortex has a discontinuity, the other one doesn't. And the other one is this one. This is my good friend, the wedge fracture of the spine. Mr. Purushoff will be very excited at home to see this. So a wedge fracture of the spine is often difficult to see that discontinuity. There is, if you look at it on something like a CT scan, but if, you, if you're looking at an X-ray, it's going to be hard to spot where the gap is in the bone that would tell you that there's a fracture there. Okay. Good. Displacement. Ah, displacement. So... Think of displacement of anything, you know, not just two bits of bone or two bits of fracture. Think of two chairs, two tables, two people. You can only ever displace them in three axes. You can only ever go along the X, the Y, and the Z axis. So if you think of those three axes, bones get displaced in exactly the same way. So if you're going to displace something along the X axis, you're going to talk about this. So we've called it shifted here, but translated is the correct term for that. So if you're going to move things on an X axis relative to each other, that I would call a translation. If you think of the y-axis, you can either make things further apart, if we call that a distraction. So in nature, if you break a bone, it's very hard to leave it in a distracted position because what's going to happen, they're going to be pulling at either end. And normally what I would say distracted means is that we've taken the bone and we've realigned it by pulling them apart. It's part of our, what we call reduction maneuvers. We'll talk about reduction in a second. The other way you can do it on the y-axis is you can overlap it. So the bone is fractured and then it's been squashed together but run past itself and you get this overlap. The other way to do it in the wire is, is to impact it. So very, very commonly, particularly in osteoporotic, osteopenic bones, the distal radius, if you think about that, if you fall and you land on your distal radius, the bone gets compacted and gets driven into itself and you get that impaction. Okay? The z-axis is a little bit um, more tenuous in the sense that they're all either angulations or rotations. But think of these two examples. So if you've got a fracture in this femur here, and I've got a drawing pin just where my arrow is there, I can use those two bits of bone like a protractor. So they'll move around and describe a circle relative to each other. And we'd call that angulation. But a different type of angulation is this. If you imagine this femur, so you've got this intracapsular neck of femur fracture. Here. If I put a skewer down the middle of this bone, I could rotate it around its whole long axis. And we generally tend to call that a rotation. Okay, everybody happy with that? <clears throat> Any questions at all? Good. Okay, so we're halfway through. So I've cheated a bit. I've got five A and B, so I've snuck a couple of extras in just as like a an extra punishment for all of you, uh, for Mr. Purushottam really. So extra articular, two types of fractures. So we're talking about fractures. Think of two different types of fractures. Extra articular fractures. So if you think about the hip, here's our hip, right? So you've got the, the hip joint made up of the femoral head and the acetabulum, so the socket in the pelvis. And together, if we put those two together, the hip joint we call the articulation. That's the correct name for it, okay? So look at these fractures. If I, uh, let me see, if I can minimize that for a second. If I come down on a list here. So Angus, what do you think of this fracture here? How would you describe that? What part of the bone is broken there? Uh, are we looking at fracture B? Uh, yeah, B here. Is that an extra articular fracture because it's the femoral sort of stem, it's not the head? Yeah, so the stem we normally talk about in an arthropathy. So if you call it the shaft or the yeah. diaphragm or the proximal part of the femur, so you can see this fracture line where Angus is saying very correctly, there's the fracture just there, and I've circled the articulation. And you can see the articulation looks exactly the same as it did in that last x ray. There's no difference in it whatsoever. The, the joint itself isn't injured, okay? How about this one? Meg, can you see this one? Yeah. <clears throat> what do you reckon? Uh, again, extra articular. Yeah. 
So see again, just like this one over here, the fracture is, it's in a different part of the shaft, but if you look where the hip joint is, actually the hip joint isn't involved at all. Yeah? The articulation that we're talking about doesn't change whatsoever, right? Good. Uh, how about this one, Brogan? And um, well, there's not multiple sort of fragments, but um, would you say it's extra articular as well? Yeah. Because so, it's sort of when you look at this x-ray, so this is the thing about orthopedics, we do a lot with uh, x-rays, you know, when you come and sit in a trauma meeting, we put big x-rays up on the screen yeah. and you see these hideous injuries. So look at this femur. If that was your femur, you'd be very, very unhappy, right? That is yes. a massive pass. That's going to be as sore as hell. There'll be a huge blood clot. There's a chance there'll be a puncture wound somewhere. The patient will likely need a transfusion and this really long, complex bout of surgery. However, the articulation is completely intact. So the mm -hmm. joint itself is not involved. So even though that fracture looks horrible, and when we talk about intra-articular and extra-articular injuries, normally we'd say intra-articular is worse. This one is an extra-articular injury, right? Because actually an extra-articular fracture is a fracture that doesn't involve the surfaces of the joint. It doesn't matter how smashed the rest of that bone is. If the joint is not involved, that is an extra-articular fracture. Okay? So the other half of that, the, other, the flip side of that coin is the intra-articular fracture. So... Look at this one. So, Wei, are you still somewhere down in my list somewhere, I think, yes? Can you see this one? What do you think uh, of the, this right hip? What do you make of it? Uh, is there a fracture? Um, yeah, is there an intra-articular fracture? So the, yes, look, at this, look at the left one, yeah? Yeah. This is called Shenton's line, and we use it yeah. as a kind of a, a, a mm. surrogate for whether this hip is okay. See, there's a nice smooth arc between yeah. the obturator foramen and the medial side of the neck. Mm. It makes a nice smooth line here. Look at this side. All of a sudden, it gets, it's okay here when you're in the obturator foramen, and then it gets very, very blurry somewhere around here. And you go, well, hang on a minute, that doesn't look right. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So if you look very carefully, and again, normally if we were sitting in the seminar room, I would zoom this up and I'd show you it properly. But if you follow the line of the cortex, it comes to an abrupt halt somewhere around about here, because actually this part of the femoral neck should be up here. So this is a neck of femur fracture. Yeah. So this is the femoral head. This is the shaft. And if you contrast the other side, I would say the fracture line probably runs somewhere in the equivalent of there. So this is an intracapsular femoral neck fracture. So, you know, the two fractured neck of femurs that we talk about, intracapsular and extracapsular, this one is the intracapsular one, which we talk about doing a hemiarthroplasty four, and you know, the risk of AVN comes up and maybe we'll talk about that in a different lecture another time. But do you think this one is intra-articular or extra-articular? What do you think, Wei? Oh, sorry, can you repeat again? My internet's a bit bad. All right, do you think this one's an intra-articular fracture or an extra-articular fracture? Um, intra, uh, intra articular fracture? So you would think it was. It's Wait, an intra capsular uh, because the capsule is going to be around about here. Uh -huh. but the fracture line's in there. But actually, if you look at the joint again, hmm. the joint is absolutely fine. The curve of the femoral head is okay. The curve of the acetabulum is okay. So the joint surfaces actually aren't involved here. So that one's an extra articular fracture. Okay. So an intra-articular fracture is a fracture that involves the articular surface of the joint. So if the joint surface itself is involved in that fracture line, then we call it intra-articular fracture. So actually, this is a hip. This is a CT of a hip which shows an actual intra-articular fracture. Can you see the fracture line isn't across the neck of the femur in this case. So here's the neck. Here's the lateral mm -hmm. neck. Here's the medial neck. The fracture is actually the head. The head has been boom, split in half. You know, we mm -hmm. call this very specially. It's called a, a Pitkin fracture, which we don't see all that often. I think I've seen about two or three in my life. So they're exceptionally uncommon. But this is an intra-articular fracture of the femoral head. And this one is a fracture of the acetabulum. Yeah, so where these arrows are pointing out, the floor of the acetabulum has been punched through. So you've got this burst of the floor of the acetabulum. So those two injuries, that femoral head fracture and that acetabular fracture, they are true intra-articular fractures in the hip because both of those joint surfaces have been involved, okay? So femoral neck fractures actually are extra articular fractures. Does that make sense? Yes. Sweet. Okay, good. So while we're talking about joints, let's talk about dislocation. So I would say 
definition of a dislocation is where you've lost connection. So you've got a complete loss of connection between both of your articular surfaces of the joint. So imagine the femoral head and the, and the uh, acetabulum, if they're apart, dislocated, okay? So this is a rather extreme example. Would anybody care to guess what joint this is? Elbow? Yeah, elbow. I have an offer of an elbow. It's not an elbow. Oh. I heard something else at the back there, sorry. Um, so I thought it might have been the knee because it's it the knee. Yeah, spot on. This is the knee of, and as you can see from the soft tissue shadow, quite a large patient of ours who uh, slipped while she was running on a laminate floor and dislocated the knee, which normally uh, is not the way to dislocate your knee. The knee doesn't dislocate without uh, a bit of a struggle. And again, maybe I'll talk about that towards the end. But anyway, so this is a dislocated knee. So you can you see that normally the distal end of the femur and the proximal end of the tibia are together. Right? So there's no connection whatsoever. So this is a dislocated knee joint. All right. However, caution. If you've been in my clinic, I must have told you this because I tell everybody this. I tell everybody exactly the same things over and over again, including my children. If you look at an x-ray, you can't make a decision on what the things, what's going on on the x-ray without getting two views. Because for your brain to work out what the problem is, you're trying to make a 3D version of something I've given you a 2D version of. So you need to get two views, each of them at 90 degrees to each other. Okay? Always got to make sure you get those two views. So look at this one. This is a shoulder dislocation. You could probably make an educated guess. <laughs> the humeral head here, and this is the glenoid back here. So you could probably make an educated guess that the two are not connected, right? But without turning the patient 90 degrees and taking this x-ray, which is called a scapular Y, there's the glenoid, there's the coracoid, there's the acromion, and there's the blade of the scapula down there, and the humeral head is sitting in front of it, okay? So this is an anterior dislocation of a shoulder. So without those two views at 90 degrees to each other, you couldn't be 100% sure that that shoulder was dislocated. It's, you could make an educated guess, but you couldn't be absolutely sure. So look at this one. Here's an ankle, okay? Can everybody see that fibular fracture? So here's the tibia, here's the talus, here's the fibula, and you can see that discontinuity. See there's a little gap there, and there's a little discontinuity just here. And this bit of bone here should be down at the very end of the fibula. Okay, so that you can see the fibula fracture, I hope, reasonably well. But without seeing the 90 degree view, you wouldn't be able to tell that that ankle is dislocated because that ankle has got absolutely no connection. The foot is not connected to the tibia anymore at all. But looking at it front on, you wouldn't be able to see that. You would miss it very, very easily. So you've always got to make sure, not just for dislocations, it's very, very good practice to look at x-rays in two planes. And 90 degrees to each other is a really good way you should look at it. Okay, so... How about this one? Uh, let me see. Hang on. Let me go down the list. Let me go down the list. Nat, are you there? Yeah, hello. Nat, hello. What do you think of this ankle? Do you think this is dislocated? Uh, yeah, I'd say so. Okay. <laughs> with, a, with a shout now, I realise I'm tempting fate by getting everybody to shout simultaneously, but uh, can I have some eyes and nays? Who agrees that this is dislocated? The eyes for dislocated? Yeah. Um, Aye. Uh, the nays, for, the nays for not dislocated. <laughs> okay, nay. I'm going to throw my nay in, and I'll tell you why. Because number seven is sublux or subluxation. And a subluxation is where you have an incomplete connection between the two articular surfaces of the joint. So what we're saying is that some part of the articular surfaces are still in connection, okay? So if you look very, very carefully at that x-ray, there's a really, really tenuous connection of around three millimeters from the talus to that tibia. So technically, although I wouldn't throw eggs at you if you rang me and said this was a dislocated ankle because it's pretty vile, technically, actually, this is a subluxed ankle. Okay. So subluxed is a part connection where you've got some degree of connection between the two and dislocation is where you've got no connection whatsoever. All right? Good. So now, if things are dislocated, reduction should be your next thing. That's probably part of our first aid, right? So reduction is where we change the position, normally change it for the better. We change the position of the fracture fragments or a dislocation to try and restore the anatomy of that joint or bone, okay? So you're taking things and moving them back to where they should be, basically. So just like 
I basically, I reduce my children's playroom every single evening because that thing is a goddamn mess. I put everything back exactly where it should be and then the children fracture it again the next day and I reduce it every evening. That's how I like to spend an hour before I So think back to the case of the knackered ankle, right? So here's our knackered ankle. So Nat, there's your knackered ankle, right? Imagine you're up in the hills. I'm, a, I'm very, very keen on walking in the hills and uh, this is your mate and he slipped over and this is his ankle. Would you want to leave him like this? I probably wouldn't teach it myself, but I don't know. So here's the thing, right? If you're, if you're miles and miles away from anywhere, if you leave this ankle like this, can you see how tented the skin over the medial malleolus is there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if that skin, if you think about it, change the situation, make that skin brain tissue. Would you leave brain tissue that ischemic for an hour? No. If it was myocardium, would you leave that myocardium that ischemic for an hour? No. No. You would never do that, right? So just because uh, fractures and dislocations have got worse PR than strokes and heart attacks, let's not ignore them, okay? So if you're out in the fells, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take your mate's boot off. You're mm -hmm. going to make that ankle just look vaguely ankle-shaped again. Because yes. all you're trying to do is take this bit of skin, take the pressure out of that bit of skin. Because otherwise, it will necrose, it will die, and then you've got an open fracture dislocation, which is a lot, lot worse than the situation you've got at the moment, okay? At the moment, this injury is closed. Nothing from the inside is outside. You change the situation. So this is actually very straightforward to reduce. What you do is you pick up the big toe, and lift the foot in the air, and it will go back again. And having done that, it will look like this. So can you see it's not perfect? If you look at this lateral view, it looks pretty good. You've still got the fracture there. We haven't cured the fracture. There's the fracture on the AP view. And this is now subluxed. So you've not quite managed to reduce it completely, but it's an awful lot better. You know, this will go into a class so you can wrap your jump around it, get the guy off the mountain, get him off the football pitch, wherever he happens to be and you won't have an open injury. So reduction is an exceptionally important, it's two things actually. Number one, it's very, very good as a first aid measure. And number two, it's excellent painkilling. If you've ever dislocated a joint, a finger, a shoulder, a toe, anything, it hurts like you wouldn't believe. I don't know if you, if you have, I dislocated my shoulder when I was 18 playing rugby and it hurt like I'd never forget. But once you put it back in, it's unbelievable how much more comfortable it is, okay? So reduction is probably better painkiller than opiates and anything else you could give. So there's reduction. Now, when we talk about reduction, there are two different types of reduction that we talk about. And you might hear us talk about these in theater. We don't often talk about them in trauma meetings, but we talk about them in theater an awful lot because they're, they're theater techniques, essentially. So an indirect reduction. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna reduce it, but you're gonna improve the alignment and the position of that without exposing where the fracture is or where the disc gate joint is. So you're not going to need a knife. You're not going to need to put anything around the fracture. You're not going to have to put your hands on the bone and pull it. So you would think about soft tissue traction. So imagine you dislocate your finger. You grab the finger, you give it a pull, normally it will reduce again, okay? If you dislocate your shoulder, we do a bit of external rotation, adduction, internal rotation. We haven't seen the shoulder. I haven't put my hands on the bones inside the shoulder, but the joint will go back again, okay? You can also use gravity. So for shoulder dislocations, if you're ever really stuck in casualty, you've got a hundred things to do. Uh, you've got a dislocated shoulder. What you do is you get them to hold a bag of saline. You put them face down on a bed with the arm hanging down and gravity will do the job for you. No problem. Uh, we can do some reduction maneuvers. I'll show you one of those in a second. And normally when we're talking about indirect reduction, we're talking about extra articular fractures. So where the joint line isn't involved and the shafts of long bone. They're very good ones to use indirect reduction for, okay? So think of this one. So I showed way one before. Jenny, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. So I've given you a normal one on the right hand side as a comparison. What about this one? What about the left one? How can you describe that for us? Um, is it extra articular? Yeah, it's definitely extra articular. So look, here's the joint line. Here's the articulation, right? The femoral head and the, um, and the acetabulum. If you think about uh, femoral neck fractures, which this one is, do you think this is intracapsular or extracapsular? Extracapsular. Fantastic. So remember, the capsule of the hip on this x-ray from the front runs along this intertrochanteric line, okay? 
So you can see the fracture is just here. Here's that discontinuity in the cortex. And you can see the lesser trochanter has got a split in it. And there's a discontinuity here. If you run your, if I run my mouse up there, it suddenly comes to a little gap here, which shouldn't be there. So they're the discontinuities of the bone. And that's the extra capsular fracture, which is displaced. Okay. So one way you could do it is make a big slash. You could get hold of the bits of bone in your hand and you could realign them. However, that's how we do it. So the patient is asleep. They're on a traction table. You can see that their foot is bound into this shoe. This is a telescopic arm, which we pull like Billy O on. We've got a little handle here, so we can jack it out just like the old Spanish Inquisition guys used to do. And by putting the traction on and using the soft tissue around the hip, you can just see in the corner of that picture, there's a realigned fracture again, okay? And there are the x-rays. So look, this is a realigned hip purely without doing any kind of surgery. That's just us pulling on the leg and changing the rotation. So the soft tissues around there have helped us to indirectly reduce that femoral neck fracture, okay? Now, isn't that smart? Isn't Mother Nature just so smart? It's not orthopedic surgeons. We just came along later on. Anyway, so if there's indirect reduction, there must be direct reduction, okay? So direct reduction is where we improve that alignment and we take away that displacement by using surgical exposure or putting our hands on the bits that are in the wrong place and putting them back physically grabbing them and putting them back. So you really need a knife to do this. It's very, very hard to do this without a knife. And normally we try and reserve them for intra-articular fractures. So let's consider this one, hang on. I can't really ask Mr. Puri Shotman a question because he's supposed to be a doctor. But uh, Millie, have we got you there? Yeah. Uh, hello, Millie. So Hi. tell me about this. What can you see in this x-ray? I can see a fracture. Fantastic, look. Here's that discontinuity in the bone. Come on, tell me more. Give me some more information. What's, which bit is fractured? The shaft. Yeah, which bone? <laughs> um, oh dear, I can't remember. Uh, the good thing about Zoom teaching <laughs> is I can't throw things at you because I'm physically just, I can just, throw things, I'll just hit my computer. So there's no violence impending today. So which bones, there's two bones in the oh, no. Or radius. <laughs> so there's a fracture in the shaft of the radius. Is it displaced or undisplaced? It is displaced. Because you can see the bone doesn't align, right? So you can see that discontinuity. So if you can see the discontinuity, it can't possibly be in the right place. It must be displaced. Uh, and for the last question, what shape do you think that fracture is? Do you think it's transverse? Do you think it's an oblique? Do you think it's a spiral? Um. My, I don't know, is it spiral? It's probably not a spiral, this one. Can you see how it's very, very short and it kind of runs straight across like that? So a spiral, mm -hmm. if you think of, you know, when you unpeel an, an orange and you get an unwinding of the peel, that's mm -hmm. what a spiral fracture is like. You're unwinding the bone, okay. whereas this one hasn't done that really. I would say probably transverse, because this guy mm -hmm. is a trampolinist and landed with his radius hitting the edge of the trampoline. So remember that transverse fracture comes from a direct blow. So he's had that direct blow to his radius. So as Millie very rightly says, you've got a transverse displaced shaft fracture of the radius in the left forearm. Now, Kamisha, can I ask you a question? Yes, you can. Okay. So thank you, first of all. So the question is, on the last slide, I just said that normally we work on intra-articular fractures with direct reduction, okay? Why do you think we think that this is an intra-articular fracture? Because there's a joint here, which looks okay, and there's a joint up here, which looks okay as well. What joint have I broken here? Um... Is, is it because the radius has also been displaced? So partly because of the displacement, but if you think about how your forearm works, so look, let's um, let's go to our let's go to human anatomy. So have a look at your forearm. If you bend your elbow and you're looking at your hand, take the index finger of your other hand and put it on your olecranon. So you know the tip of your elbow back here. 
put your finger on the tip of the electron on here. And while you've got your finger there, turn your hand backwards and forwards. So pronate and supinate your hand. Are you all doing that? Yep. So is your electron on moving while you're doing that? No. Not at all. So the ulna is absolutely still. The joint that we've disrupted by breaking the bone here is the interosseous membrane that joins the radius and the ulna together. So the radius and the ulna, the forearm bones, work as a unit. So if you break one and it's displaced, so which is why I say you're partly right, if you break one and it's displaced, you've disrupted the joint, which is the unit of the forearm. So if we leave this this way, the pronation and supination will be lost, which is why we need to get this absolutely spot on, which is why we need direct reduction, Kamisha. So here's the operation that we did for that, okay? So if you look here, this is the, the hand will be off at this end. The elbow is up here. Here are my hands here. This thing here is a clamp. It's a bone clamp, which we've physically clamped onto the radius. And I'm put another one on this one here. Here's the fracture. And this is it after you've reduced it. And there's no way we can reduce this and get it absolutely spot on without physically seeing it and putting the bones back to exactly where they should be. Because if it's not exactly where it should be, that joint won't work properly, okay? Good. Any questions about those two, indirect and direct reduction? Because we don't talk about those an awful lot. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. So then the last one then is callus. So if you do everything right and Mother Nature's on your side and everything works okay, callus is an in intermediate stage of indirect bone healing. So if you might remember from a lecture about three years ago about how bones heal, there's direct and indirect bone healing. So indirect bone healing is when you leave the bone to heal by itself. So if you, put your, if you break your wrist, you put it in a plaster and Mother Nature does the work for you, that's what we call indirect bone healing, okay? So an intermediate stage of that is when the, the fracture hematoma, so if you break a bone, you get a hematoma, that hematoma turns into very immature bone, which we call callus. And the important thing about it is this, when we can see callus, we know that that bone must be healing or there's a reasonable guess that that bone must be healing. So we can start to get that bone working a little bit. We don't want to keep bones too still. We don't want to keep them from working because they lose their density. Joints get very stiff. So we need to start those joints and bones moving and working as soon as we can. So think about those four stages of bone healing. Here's a broken femur again. So the first stage is you get this heat mm -hmm. And then the second stage is you get all the angiogenesis, the pro-inflammatory media come in and they change that hematoma into very, very new soft bone, which we call callus. And then the callus hardens, which is stage three. You get this organized callus. And the fourth stage is where you get remodeling of the bone and it starts to look like a normal bone. This one happens pretty much the minute that you break a bone. This one happens within the first week or so. This one a little bit further down the line between, depending on which bone you're talking about, somewhere between weeks four to week eight, 12, something like that. And this process where the bone remodels goes on for many, many months, 18, 20 months or so before it's done. Again, depending on how old you are. So here's an example. Here's an example of one of the many reasons I love children. Children's bones are remarkably forgiving. So here's a child's humerus. So you can see the fracture. You see that discontinuity of the bone just there and here as well. And as the days and the weeks go by and you can just see them across the top of the screen, you can see even though the alignment isn't great, can you see all this fluffy white stuff? This is where the fracture hematoma has been and it's being changed into callus as the months and weeks go by. And you can see as the weeks go by, that callus starts to mature and it starts to get slimmer and slimmer until eventually the bones united. And that's the, that's the wonder of callus. Okay. Good. So there we go. There are my 10, 10 words that I was going to define for you today with a few subtypes. So before I come back to that, let me just stop that share for two seconds. And unmute everybody. Good. Are there any questions, anyone? No. I have a question about impactions. Um, yeah. You said that so the bone washed down. How do you fix that? Because if that was, say, an impaction on the femur, wouldn't legs be different lengths afterwards or not? So again, it depends on how old the patient is. Actually, if you have an impacted femoral fracture and you're a child, if you're a baby, the thing you would actually bizarrely warn the patient, <coughs> that leg is going to overgrow because the bone is so wildly turnover. It will grow and grow and grow until actually the bone overgrows. So you might have to warn them that the leg that they've broken is going to be longer. If it was you, for example, Angus, 
what you would try and do is try and pull the bone back out to length, get the alignment correct and get the rotation of the bone right and fix it. And actually what will happen is the smash bits will get taken away and redissolved and you will make that callus and then you will make this new bone and actually it'll, it'll heal pretty well. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Any other questions? Um, you know, in terms of displacement, you were naming which fractures are likely for each axis. Yes. For the X axis, you can root shifted. Yeah. What was the other one? So the X axis we've called was, was translation a... or a shift. The Y axis, you yeah. can either lengthen it so you'll get a distraction. So the picture I showed you, the direct reduction, I would have done some distraction there to realign those two lengths and then dock them together again. Or the bone can be short, so it can either jam together and miss. Yeah. You get an overlap or it'll jam in and like Angus says you'll get this action. and the z-axis is the rotation okay okay rotate yeah that's fine just yeah any other questions okay i have one other very random question yeah go uh, for it. it's about shoulders you talked earlier about when you dislocate a shoulder it's best to to lie on your front and then hang your arm down mm -hmm. with the weight in it Yes. A friend of mine once relocated sh someone's shoulder by externally rotating and then pushing in. Is yes. that also the correct method? Or is there, that are, there are so many. I, again, if you've ever seen another one of my talks, I've got a, a slide where I said there are many ways to skin a cat. Shoulder reduction is, is a very, very good example of that. I, okay. I personally have used, I think, out over a dozen different techniques as my career has gone on. So there are lots and lots of different ways of, re of, uh, of doing a shoulder reduction. The method that your friend has used sounds like it's what's called a Stimson, uh, not Stimson's, a uh, Cocker's method, which is an external rotation, an adduction, internal rotation. Stimson's method is that one. It's a very lazy one. You get the patient to do all the work for you while you go and have a cup of tea. You lie them on the floor, <laughs> lie their arm with a bag hanging down and gravity will pull it. Eventually it'll overcome the spasm in the muscles and it'll just relocate the shoulder for you. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, guys? Lovely. All right, let me go back to that last slide then. So here's the most important slide of the, uh, of the morning, right? So you can ask me whatever questions you want. So like I say, the unusual thing is normally we would have you in the hospital and I get a chance to teach you and show you patients and do various bits and pieces. So if you want to contact us, contact me, there's my email address. And actually, if I could ask you a favor of all of you who've been logged on today, if you've got two minutes today, could you just drop me a quick email to that email address? Just tell me, <laughs> Something that was rubbish about this, something that was good about it, and something either you'd like me to teach you about, or like Mr. Purushobha to teach you about, or any suggestions about what we could do, okay? If you could send me that email today, that I would be eternally grateful, because I promise you, we're kind of making this up as we go along, but we'd, we'd really like to try and do it for the betterment of you guys, okay? Yeah. Um, what I would thought we might do as the weeks go on is talk about some practical things as well, so... Um, I had a lecture in mind of how to survive a trauma meeting without feeling you want to top yourself. Um, I was wondering whether you might want to learn about how we uh, look at a research paper, how you read a research paper and make something out of it. Not a paper or airplane, actually make something out of it in the sense of clinical practice. Um, and also, I'm not allowed to, well, I mean, even in good times, I'm not allowed to really touch people, but I can touch my children and my wife, uh, only if my wife's looking. But I could show you some examinations by using my children as, uh, as the patients. If you're interested in doing that, I can do a little bit of uh, examining with the kids. I think my children are more keen than you guys might be. But that's another possible too. But just, again, <laughs> just let me know if, the, if those are the kind of things, okay? So drop me an email. Yeah. Something bad and a suggestion, okay? I need a three, three lines of that email. Um, Mr. Purush Hoffman and I have both got Twitter accounts, so you can tweet me. I'm imaginatively titled at Y Mitchell. Uh, and Ms. Purushottam is at Balaji Purush. I think you've spelled that wrongly. Sorry, Yusuf. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry, Balaji. What have I done? You've just spelled my Twitter thing wrongly. That's all. That's all right. Nothing else. Go on, give us a correction, Balaji. Spell it out for us. No, you've got an extra S there. That's it. Nothing else. I, oh, my apologies. My apologies. Yeah. Um, and our department's teaching feed is author fragments. So you can always message us there, ask us questions there. So any of those three, drop us a line. Let us know what you think, okay? Cool. Right. So, you. you're very welcome. If there are, are there any more questions before I log off? No, no, the minutes. No. Okay, guys. Well, look. Thank you for uh, joining me this morning. My salute to you all. Have a lovely day in the sunshine, and I'll nice I'll one, Mr. Mitchell. Thank very you, good. Mr. I'll see you guys soon. Okay. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank see you later, guys.
Thank yeah. you. Bye.